Hello, I'm Charlie Rossiter, and welcome to Poetry Spoken Here on YouTube. We're the longest-running all-poetry interview podcast in existence. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. But you don't have to wait for YouTube uploads. You can also download the show from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Poetry Spoken Here. This is producer and technical director Jack rossiter Munley. Welcome to our special series on poetry and war. In case you missed our announcement last week, we are releasing a series of podcasts in honor of April, Poetry Month, all of them on the topic of poetry and war. New episodes will go up every Friday this month, so be sure to subscribe via the iTunes store or wherever you get your podcasts. We're starting our series with the war that more than any other is associated with poetry, World War I. I had a great teacher in high school who always said World War I changed everything. In today's episode, we will hear my interview with Sam Grake. Sam is a master's student at the University of Chicago, studying the literature of World War I. We discuss the social and cultural landscape of World War I, how that war influenced poets and writers, and what changed in poetry, society, and culture as a result of this rupturing event that traumatized Europe for a generation. Be sure to check out next week's show as well, where Sam and I will talk about specific poets and poems from World War I. Just a heads up for this interview, and if you're already conversant in World War I poetry, feel free to skip ahead about 20 or 30 seconds, but I wanted to note that we refer to a few poets in the course of the conversation by only their last names. Next week, we're going to talk more about all of these famous folks, their personal stories, their literary output, but here's a quick primer on a couple that you will hear mentioned. Siegfried Sassoon. He was a war poet who was known particularly for his political outrage, and at one point, because of his outspoken criticism of the war, was sent to a mental hospital. Uh, The title of this podcast is actually taken from his poem, Absolution. Wilfred Owen was a younger war poet. He greatly admired Sassoon. They actually met while both at that mental hospital. Uh, Owen tragically died just weeks before the end of the war. Uh, We also talk about Edward Blunden a little bit. He was another friend of Sassoon's who is very well known for his work, both in poetry and in prose. So without further ado, here is my interview with Sam Grake. Sam, thank you so much for being on the podcast. To start off with, I was going to ask a fairly specific question, but... Actually, I'll start with a more general question. What impact did World War I have on poetry and literature? What was different about it as a result of World War I? I know that's a big question. So I guess it had really different effects on different places and different cultures and different bodies of work. I think that it encouraged this burgeoning movement away from formalism and from structuralism. It certainly brought kind of the unspoken into um, a public view. Um, I think Virginia Woolf is a really good example of that um, with mental illness and sexuality and pain and memory um, kind of being prominently placed in front of readers in ways that they hadn't been before. Um, And that's funny because in a lot of ways, uh, the increasing availability of... um, uncommon topics had actually a lot to do with uh, social structures and power hierarchies being necessarily broken down as a result of the war. So like the um, disassembling disassembling of inheritance laws, for example, allowed money to move differently, which caused education to happen differently, which allowed more people more access to resources and more of those people had more pain, I guess, to share. Um, It was kind of like this, you know, big traumatic thing happened to Europe and people felt very international as a result of it. So there was a lot of international feeling at the time, but I imagine the responses from country to country were quite different. Can you talk a little bit about how different countries responded differently to the war? I think that in France, people felt really bitter about it. A lot of French people thought um, we should have just joined the Germans in the first place because then this wouldn't have happened. Um, 
because they're, I mean, they were basically the, the site of the trauma. Um, and I spent last year trekking along the Western Front and going to the places where the violence actually happened. And I mean, it's still perfectly visible today. Um, and so I think that France probably felt the most material damage as a result of the war. Um, and I think in response to it in literature, um, there was this focus on war as uh, an external force that um, negates or takes away local identity. In Germany, uh, I think Germany's where I'm focusing right now. Actually, it's what I'm writing my thesis on. Um, but the war was handled very strangely um, because Germany kind of was going through this industrial peak right before the war happened. Um, they had this kind of um, sense of being like a meteoric power that couldn't be stopped. Um, the intention of the you know governing body was to challenge Britain um, and to eventually overtake them militarily. Um, and that obviously didn't happen. <laughs> Um, and so the population had kind of been primed for, um, for victory. Um, everyone was anticipating being able to kind of disseminate German enlightenment to the greater European continent. There was going to be this like beautiful, peaceful after war German superstructure that everyone was looking forward to. And all of these young people in particular um, were exceptionally well educated and really idealistic and after the war their identities were meaningless they didn't really know what it meant to try and be a german um now that the war was over um and they couldn't really celebrate their experiences because they had lost so they were you know the bad guys internationally um and so there was this really strange movement um in which people kind of wrote about the war in a vacuum um, kind of separated from culture, separated from politics, separated even from their own emotions about it because their emotions might not cohere either with the contemporary narrative of loss or with the former narrative of grandeur. Can you compare a little bit how the war was dealt with differently in literature in Britain as opposed to in Germany? So whereas in Britain, people were saying, you know, oh, the war was a terrible thing, it was a mistake, our government was wrong, you know, there's all these corrupt power figures who are forcing us to do these terrible things to other human beings. It's so tragic, it's so terrible, look at the loss of life. Like, it was highly sentimentalized. Um, whereas in Germany, there was virtually no sentiment wrapped up in it whatsoever, because most people's sentiments were attached to the idea of winning. And because they had lost it's like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, my, my emotions are kind of um, invalidated by the result of the war. I can't feel bad for myself because I've been made into the bad guy by the rest of Europe. Um, and so I think instead of developing a field of psychology <laughs> like Britain eventually did, um, a lot of German veterans would just write in extreme detail. A lot of the detail is not emotional detail, it's just factual right. detail of events. So you talked a little bit about how the war elicited different responses in different places, and that Virginia Woolf is an example of a certain kind of response, and a certain mm -hmm. uh, almost presence of absence kind of idea. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about that, and maybe give an example of what post-World War I, her work sort of looks like compared to a good example of what was going on before the war and how the war made that sort of literary shift happen. Before the war in Britain, um, Britain is, has historically been really isolated from, I guess, the artistic trends of the rest of Europe, um, of continental Europe. And so um, narrative, I mean, the 19th century Victorian novel Oops, you went out again, but it's okay. Um, the 19th century Victorian novel had a really sort of standard format, and there was, of course, a lot of variation within it, but um, for the most part, they were realist novels um, with uh, identifiable tropes and structures. I think Dickens is a good example of um, someone who is experimenting within the acceptable 
narrative structure. There were tropes like the angel in the house and heroes. Um, people were usually highly individualized as characters, as narrative tropes. Um, sentimental novels were really popular. Um, something like a, a Jane Austen style novel where um, you know, the protagonist begins being kind of not wholly formed and ends by being a more complete, mature character who's prepared to go into British society and, you know, be stoic and effective and successful and so on and so forth. So um, I guess I kind of think about <laughs> pre-World War One Britain as being very stuck in this sort of aristocratic narrative mode um, where there were really distinct guidelines for what was and wasn't acceptable in narrative. Um, and like I said, while there was some variation, you know, certainly like George Eliot um, experimented within the boundaries, the type of novel was still the same. Poetry rhymed, poetry had meter, poetry had stanzas, you know, there were, there were all these formal structures that for the most part were followed quite closely. Um, even though in continental Europe, they were starting to be taken apart. And I think that the war um, put highly educated people. I mean, Britain sent their wealthiest, most educated young men to war first. Um, and so all the people who were learning how to do these things were suddenly put into a situation where there were no literary or academic authority figures around them. Um, and they were having experiences that didn't necessarily cohere with the tropes that they had been given to work with. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those structures were and what were some of the important ones? I imagine religion is a major power structure in society that underwent some changes at the time. Dismantling religion, I think, was another big part of it. Um, with formal education came a lot of, like, um, I guess, coded authority acceptance you accepted the church, you accepted the paternal structure, so on and so forth. And um, in the war, people were just able to see that this was not going to get them anywhere. You know, it wasn't being a good Christian wasn't going to save you when the German artillery showed up. And so um, dismantling Christ in poetry sort of happened alongside dismantling narrative structure in poetry. Um, I think that... Uh, particularly after the war, the breakdown of psyche, um, of post-traumatic stress disorder. Masses of people came back from the fronts um, with all kinds of problems and all kinds of experiences that didn't cohere with formalism or structuralism or Victorian novel format um, or sonnets or, you know, meter or what have you. Um, and... I guess because, it, I mean, society just couldn't escape um, from the trauma that had been experienced. I think it just necessarily came out in writing. Um, and people, authors in particular, I think took um, a vanguard position at rejecting the political structures that they saw as being bound up with pre-war structuralism. One term that comes up all over the place with this stuff and sort of going to what you're saying is this idea of breakdown, that yes. in World War One there's a breakdown of pretty much everything. So mm -hmm. society, religion, inheritance laws, old right. structures, and that shows up in, in the literature. Right. Um, you talked about how poetry, particularly in Britain, used to rhyme and sort of stopped. Can you talk about a couple of specific breakdowns that happened in poetry and literature in Britain? Like what, what are the formal rules that used to be in place for writing poetry in Britain that broke down and sort of never got built back up again in Britain? Okay. Um, I mean, I think the way that love was written about is a really big one. Um, Rupert Brooke is a great example for this because he was um, a well-recognized poet before the war started and his first sort of successful poetry was published in the first year of the war. And he wrote sonnets. Um, and he wrote these charming sonnets about being in love with the war, <laughs> um, ironically. And they rhyme and they're very pretty. Um, and I guess they kind of, they behave the way the sonnets are supposed to behave. Um, he 
died of sepsis as the result of a mosquito bite. Also somewhat ironic given that he was drafted into the army and wasn't killed in action. Um, but Sassoon also wrote sonnets and you can see that by the end of the war, Sassoon was being published, but his sonnets um, were ironically about love. They're not the kind of sonnets that are um, pure and sentimental. I think that um, while before the war, I think it would have been virtually impossible to get anything published that didn't rhyme, that didn't follow the rules of earnest sentimentality, that wasn't in the kind of like um, pastoral good faith, I guess that people like to have published in nice books in their libraries, um, it wouldn't have gotten published. But by the end of the war, you know, people certainly did continue to write that way and they certainly did continue to be published, but there was also a contingency of mostly younger people writing, um, writing like horror and trauma and irony into these old forms and then even just breaking down the forms. You know, there was free verse, um, as compared to continental Europe, Britain was still remarkably conservative, but something like The Wasteland, you know, was published in 1922 or 23, um, and certainly wouldn't have been publishable before the war. It was, you know, huge, first of all, and um, was a series of poetic sketches as opposed to, you know, a coherent poetic structure that would have been recognizable to a publisher. There's definitely an impression that there was sort of an outpouring of poetry and cultural products in general yeah. as a result yeah. of World War One. How accurate is that impression? It's very accurate. <laughs> um, like I said kind of earlier, um, World War I changed the way education and resources flowed. Um, I think in the period right before and right after World War One in Paris, there were more daily newspapers and periodicals being published than at any other time in the history of France. So lots of people had lots of access to lots of like written media space. Um, more people could read than ever before. With that many different outlets for writing, there's also more need for writers. There's yeah, more exactly. The writing to go in them. Yeah. Um, and expressionism and surrealism were taking off. So World War One. Um, for continental Europe happened sort of right in the middle of um, this revolutionary change that was happening in art and literature and writing and in culture. Um, performance art and music was changing also. You know, there was like experimentation with atonality, um, with, you know, men in tight bodysuits dancing in ballets. Um, all of that was like totally unprecedented. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, public sentiment wrapped up in it. Art was highly politicized. Um, and I think that made it really magnetic for a lot of people. Um, and so when all of these people who were kind of steeped in a tradition of politicized art were sent off to war, though, you know, art went to the front with them um, and it came back too. <laughs> and so the war ended up appearing in art in a lot of ways, um, whether it's like, broken lines or the crazy futurist stuff that showed up in Italy afterwards. Um, the war, I think, prompted people who um, might not have felt like they had anything to say before the war to feel that they really did have something to say. And I think that in Britain, um, one of the largest outpourings of art came from people who felt like their experiences were invisible to the public. Um, and they might have been, you know, outraged while they were there. We're here about poetry. I think the impression is also that poetry played a larger role in the response to World War One mm -hmm. than at any other time. So, like, we tend to associate, at least in America, like, popular music with a response to Vietnam. I think right. conceptually the cultural response to World War One is thought of mm -hmm. particularly with British poets. Um, yes. And then subsequently the lost generation from people like Hemingway who are really informed by their war experience. Right. Did poetry as a means of cultural response, was it disproportionately present? Even though there was a lot of different things going on, was there actually compared to other times, a lot of really high level poetry that was connecting with people going on at the time? Is that 
a pretty accurate understanding or is it just that yeah there happened to be more poetry than usual but it was still sort of outweighed by these other cultural productions no i think that and i i know that i have a source that said this it's not just me but i can't remember who it was um but there was certainly a higher level of poetry publication happening um during and after the first world war and i think that I mean, in part, that's a response to the restrictive Victorian, you know, literary standards and poetry being an easier form to, I guess, um, take on for oneself and break down or modify. It's, you know, easier to kind of get one instance of trauma or irony into a poem than to write a whole novel about it. Um, And I think because a lot of officers, um, I'm thinking of, um, Edmund Blunden and Sassoon in particular were being published so widely during the war. Um, you know, their educated uh, privates probably wanted to try to engage in that conversation as well. Um, and I think that because, um, you know, poetry has kind of been put on this sentimental pedestal for so many hundreds of years that it really took a took a shot at the heart of British aristocratic culture to um, put irony into a poem or to put anti-religion into a poem or to put, you know, male homosexuality into a poem. All of those were really subversive ways to express your pain and displeasure with the choices of the country. Following up with that a little bit in general, how popular was poetry at the time to a large audience? Um, the audience for poetry at the time, um, I have been so narrowly focused on the poets themselves that other than each other, I'm not exactly sure who they were writing for. Um, I know that there, (laughs) you know, there were literary circles, plenty of literary circles, both in Britain and in continental Europe. Um, and I think that frequently the circles of authors and artists were creating for each other, for themselves and that that was perhaps the intention. Um, I think that the broader readership was not quite a byproduct, but um, I don't think that they were the the primary target. I think that some poets like Thomas Hardy was very specifically trying to let other people like himself know what was going on. Um, So people of a middle to upper middle class background who had kids who were at the war and didn't really know what was happening and thought it was a grand adventure and it wasn't. Um, And that's really a bummer. (laughs) Um, And so I think that there were some poets who were specifically trying to, you know, target mainstream magazines um, or literary magazines and get their work published. And that work tends to be a little bit more conservative, um, a little bit less subversive because they want it to be read broadly. And, um, you know, just because there was a, a huge population of traumatized, literarily subversive young men coming home from the front didn't necessarily mean that the broader population wanted to read their strange new work. Um, (laughs) a lot of people were, you know, too disturbed by the idea of how bad the war actually was to really want anything to do with the written work that came out of it. So I think the preoccupation with British war poetry came much later, I think in the 50s and 60s, when people started trying to create this coherent cultural narrative was when it became um, more focused on. So it sounds like there was a lot of the poetry at the time. It was very important to the people making it and to the mm-hmm. people who had similar experiences and right. sort of a similar cultural background, but mm-hmm. our popular conception of maybe how important it was to the war at the time or to people's understanding of the war at the time is a product of later writing about those war poets and that war poetry as opposed to them having major cultural influence at the time. Yes, I think that would be an accurate representation or analysis of it. So going along with that, it sounds like the answer is going to be not very, but just out of curiosity, Mm -hmm. how well known would those war poets themselves have been at the time? Right. So, um, you know, a small handful of them became quite well known. Most of them were not terribly well known. Um, Sassoon and Graves were so political that they became kind of, you know, 
living room names. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the majority of poets didn't become better known until people started sort of collecting anthologies of great war poetry. Since there's such a big part of the war and of the writing about the war, I wanted to make sure to ask you to say a, a little something about trenches. Yeah, sure. Um, I love trenches. Um, I had the opportunity to hike and sleep in trenches last year, and it was great. Um, it was wet and cold and, you know, generally miserable. I felt like I had a really authentic experience. Um, so I guess I... Uh, think of trenches as being an extension of the modern industrial apparatus at the time. Um, so whereas in previous wars, um, individuals had specific purposes, um, individuals could distinguish themselves. Um, you know, there were these constantly changing formations. There was like the column approach and then the like left flanking approach and, you know, whatever you go into battle in armies and there's this sort of constant mobility um, trenches are basically like a giant factory put in the ground in order to manufacture military presence. Um, and that was something that had obviously never happened before. Um, and not only that, but they were in, um, you know, incoherent spaces. There would be this giant uh, semi-permanent military apparatus dug into, you know, someone's fields or into a forest or into a town even sometimes. Um, so I think trenches are like the, uh, they're a symbol of the immobility of the war, but they're also a symbol of, you know, the extension of mechanization into places where mechanization shouldn't be. Um, and they, you know, essentially ended up manufacturing constant death, even when there wasn't battle actively going on, the trenches kind of became these death traps um, where people were sinking into the mud and drowning in it or, um, you know, like a bomb would go off in the trench and it would cause like a series of little built up shanties to collapse and kill far more people than like a bomb landing in a field full of people would have, for example. Um, so I think um, sort of in that vein, trenches were also um, the forceful enclosure of um, a population by its own powers that be um, trenches were intentionally designed to disorient the people inside of them. Um, so with all of these networks of trenches that kind of spidered towards the front, if you were a soldier in the front trench, there was absolutely no way you could figure out how to move back. Um, you couldn't retreat if you were in a trench um, and you couldn't desert if you were in a trench. The only place to go was over the top. Um, and so people were, uh, you know, like in factories, sort of enclosed in their workspace, which had obviously never happened in military exploits before. Um, they also were three walls constantly. The only place that wasn't part of the trench was up. Um, and with the introduction of poison gas and airplanes and zeppelins into the war, you know, soldiers were kind of like, they were boxed in on all sides by um, aspects of the war. So there was really, if you were in a trench, nowhere to look that wasn't part of the occupation of war. Um, and that's why I think they were so important. I mean, they were um, the apparatus, the symbol, um, and the sort of preventative measure that forced people to be constantly um, in and aware of the fact that they were at war. Sam, thank you so much for talking. Let's continue this conversation next week and pick up right where we left off. That does it for this episode of Poetry Spoken Here. Remember that you can always visit us on our website, poetryspokenhere.com, where you can find our blog. Be sure to subscribe on the iTunes store, or you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash poetryspokenhere. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash poetryspokenhere. And if you have suggestions for future podcasts, comments about this podcast, or if you want to send in your own work to possibly be on the air, you can send it to poetryspokenhere at gmail.com.
www.thepeopleshow.com.